Thank you for listening to this recording of Family Bible Church's Sunday morning message. We pray that God will use this word to bless and encourage you. Acts 17, I'll be reading verses 1 through 15. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as was his custom, as his custom was, went into them, and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, This Jesus, whom I preach to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded, and a great multitude of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women, joined Paul and Silas. But the Jews, who were not persuaded, becoming envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace and, gathering a mob, set all the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, These who have turned the world upside down have come here also. Jason has harbored them, and these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king, Jesus. And they troubled the crowd and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. So when they had taken security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Therefore many of them believed, and also not a few of the Greeks, prominent women, as well as the men. But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was preached by Paul at Berea, they came there also and stirred up the crowds. Then immediately the brethren sent Paul away to go to the sea, But both Silas and Timothy remained there. So those who conducted Paul brought him to Athens, and receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him with all speed, they departed. And may the Lord add his blessing to the reading from his word this morning. You may be seated. All right, we have been studying the book of Acts now for a few months. And um, as we've been in the book of Acts, we transitioned now into primarily than the ministry of Paul and what God was doing in the life of Paul. And over the last couple weeks, um, we've been discussing how the second missionary journey, quote unquote, that Paul and Silas went on. And um, and we remember how they left from Antioch, remember, and they traveled um, up through Tarsus because they traveled by foot, okay, into the the southern region of Galatia. We talked about that two weeks ago. Um, And then um, encouraging the brethren there in Derby and Lystra and Iconium. Um, we'll come back to that in just a moment, the things there. Antioch, and then they, they were, tried to go from there as they finished up there in Pamphylia and such, that they wanted to go down into the region of Asia, or Asia, okay? But the Holy Spirit forbade them from going there. And then from there, they tried to go to Bithynia, and the Holy Spirit closed the door going into Bithynia as well. And so they continued on straight then, and they went to Mysia, Okay, these are all provinces of Rome. And Troas was the chief city of Mysia, and it was, it was on the, the um, coast. And so while they were in Troas, um, they had this vision. Uh, Paul had a vision of the man from Macedonia saying, come over here, right? I thought it was interesting as, um, as um, I was listening to testimony time, especially Mike, you. Um, and does anybody remember the, when we talked two weeks ago, I think it was two weeks ago, we talked about how God moves how God directs us, right? Does anybody remember the, my first point? How does he, what's the, what's the first thing that he uses in, in an individual's life to guide him and direct him? Say again? Nope, that was number four. Say again? That was number two. <laughs> First, desire. Desires. Your desires. Now again, you got to be careful with your desires, right? Because you have to delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. So it's not just what you want. But God does use many times what we want. And so you, Mike, for days were wanting to what? Fish. Fish. 
And so God used a desire, a delight, you know, go fishing in order for him to really do what he declared for he was going to do, right? Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. So you went fishing, but you caught men or women, actually, at that moment. <laughs> yeah, praise the Lord for that, right? And so, um, and so God uses those things. And so he's pushing them through. And so then he uses the special number two with circumstances, right? Because he closed the doors, okay, for them to go in. And then he uses special revelation. He gave them a, a, a dream. And so they went over into there. And then, yes, we talked about the fourth one being the word of God, which is probably the most important one, because all those other three have to be in conformance to what God has already declared. Okay? So, but as he, they go up then, they go over into Philippi, which was the chief city um, up there in Macedonia. And as we're look at, look today, um, they're going to travel now down into Thessalonica and down into Berea. And I don't know about you, but as I'm, I'm doing this message, this was a, a side thought. This was a desire of my heart, okay? And so I, being the math guy, right, I thought to myself, how far is that really? I mean, because these guys, they're not, they didn't take the bus. They didn't get on the plane. They didn't have a car. They didn't have a, mice, a bicycle. They didn't have a moped. They were what? They were walking, right? And so, how far is this? So, so I went on the Google Maps. You guys have been here long enough. You know, I went on Google Maps, right? And I, and, I, and I pulled up that region, okay? And then I took it, and I brought it over, shh, over to the United States, and I superimposed it upon the United States, okay? So, this is that region. So, this is Antioch here, and he's coming down through where um, Tarsus would be, and then through the, the, the southern portion of Galatia, up into here, he tries to get into Asia, then he goes over to Bithynia, then he comes into Mysia, to Troas, and then he goes to Somathrace, up into um, Philippi, and then today we're going to talk about him coming down in Thessalonica and down into Berea. And so I said, well, okay, now i got to get rid of the map, right? i got to get rid of that map, and i got to put it onto the U.S. Well, it, the Hays aren't here today, so if the Hays were here, that would be exciting for David, because it's close to where he's from, right? He'd understand that, but that doesn't make any sense to me, because I'm not from Virginia, right? So I had to say what? Well, what does that look like if I come to Augusta? Now, Fishers, where are you guys at? Does this look familiar to you? Yeah. So it ends almost there at Wichita, okay? And so it goes all the way from Augusta, and they, they, they knew that there was a blockage on I-20, so they went up through South Carolina to come back, okay? And um, when Dad says, I know a shortcut, that's when vacation begins, right? <laughs> Anyways, so... <laughs> This is a long walk, 1,100 miles. Okay, now that's not with all the bends in it. So 1,100 miles is from Augusta to Wichita by how Google would give you walking. Okay, so I went on the, the, the Google thing. So, so to Wichita, so that's, uh, if I straighten that out just a little bit and take it to Wichita, right? But you can see if you really straighten it out, it's what? It's beyond Wichita. Okay, so it's probably more than 1,100 miles. But 1,100 miles, okay? Now, I didn't take Google's because Google's assuming you're going to walk at four miles an hour or three miles an hour at, for 24 hours a day. I'm assuming you're not going to do that, okay? So, so I assumed three miles an hour, okay, which is still a massive clip if you've ever done a lot of walking. A good clip is four miles an hour, okay? So three miles an hour, eight miles, eight miles a day, eight hours a day, 48 to 50 days straight walking. So that kind of puts things in perspective when you talk about, I want to evangelize for Christ and I'm going to travel around to do that, right? Paul has his burden for Jesus. He wanted to travel that way originally to do what? To destroy the church. But now with the same passion that he had to destroy the church, he wants to build the church. He wants to tell people about it. And I'm just thinking to myself, would I walk? To Wichita, Kansas? I mean, nothing personal against you, Kansas could be okay. But when I walk to Wichita, Kansas, in order for them to hear about Jesus, I don't know if I'd walk to Thompson, Georgia. We live in a different day. Make sense? But think about that. Now, growing up in a city, we walked everywhere. I took a bus everywhere. I didn't have a car until I started dating Marsha, and she lived an hour and a half from Pittsburgh. I didn't think my dad wanted me to borrow the car to, to go that. So I had to buy myself a junker to, to be able to make that trip, okay? But I walked everywhere. Miles, I mean, you guys laugh, but you walked for miles. 
okay? But even when I think about those miles that I walked, it's only three to ten miles at a, at a chunk. I know, uphill both ways. You could add a little bit of time to that, okay? And I could tell you some of the walks that I took, okay? But still, 1,100 miles? What is telling Jesus, telling people about Jesus? How important is it to you? What are you willing to do to tell people about Jesus? How far are you willing to walk? What ordeals are you willing to go through? Well, Paul was told way back in the beginning by the prophet Ananias. Well, he wasn't told. Actually, Jesus told the prophet Ananias when Ananias was balking that he didn't want to go, Lord, you know who this guy is? You're sending me to this guy who wants to kill me? And he says, no, no, you need to go. Why? Because go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles, kings and children of Israel. Get to the last part, though. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Guess what Paul's starting to learn? How many things he must suffer for the name of Christ. How long did it take for Paul, or should we actually say Saul, because he's still Saul of Tarsus at that time. He's not Paul yet. How long did it take Saul of Tarsus to go from being the persecutor to the persecuted? How many? Say, say Phil, let's go on. Just like that. Yeah, just days. There in Damascus. So see, he starts here in Damascus. That's where he gets saved, right? But instantly, you're going to get a red one coming around it. Because instantly, he changes. In a minute, he changes from the persecutor of the church to the proclaimer of the church. He becomes the persecuted. And so he begins being persecuted in Damascus, where they have to they put him up on a basket over the wall to get out. And he goes down to Jerusalem. What happens in Jerusalem? He begins to proclaim Jesus. What happens there? The Jews start to try to want to kill him again. And so the, the brethren have to snake him off, and they, they take him down to Caesarea, and then sail up to Tarsus to get him out of Dodge. Right? And so then he goes to Antioch, and he goes with, um, to, um, with Barnabas over to Cyprus, and in Paphos, Paphos, we understand the, the battle with Bargesus, you know, Elymas, right? But then from there, they go up to Antioch, and from Antioch, they go down into the Lystra Derby, Iconium area, and it's down in Lystra that he's what? He's stoned. Stoned to death. Or what appears to be death. Again, we don't know how to prove that biblically, but he's left for dead. Everybody believes that he's dead. They pray over him, and he gets back up, and he does what? He goes back in the city. He goes back into the city, right? And so we've seen, oh, I missed one. I did. There we go. Lystra, right? And then last two weeks ago, we saw him, how it continued, even when he comes into Macedonia. I wonder whether there's part of Paul that thought that if he got out of, out of that Asia Minor area, that maybe things might go better, right? But he goes to Philippi, and he has the same thing happen. So they're thrown into prison, right? They, the stripes laid upon him and all that kind of stuff, and they're thrown into prison. Well, we see the same thing plays out, not that he's going to get be persecuted a whole lot, but even today as we move into Thessalonica and Berea, we say this, see the same thing happen, that there's going to be this... Um, this group that's going to come against him that because of the gospel. And as we talked about in Sunday school, the reality is when you are faced with truth, you have two options. You either receive it or you reject it. And that's exactly, again, the title, right? Reception or rejection. That's exactly what we see happening with, with Paul um, in Silas and, and Timothy as, as they begin their travels here, right? And so let's begin with then the ministry in Thessalonica. And in both of these, the ministry in Thessalonica and the ministry uh, of Berea, we see both the reception of the gospel then the rejection of, of the gospel as well. And the first part here with, um, in Thessalonica, with the reception of the gospel, right? We're told that Paul reasoned from the scriptures for three Shabbats, three Sabbaths, Okay. And so the word to reason there, dia legomai, okay, is to say thoroughly or through. So the dia is the um, preposition, meaning to go through or um, according to, okay? And so legomai then is to speak in, in through words, okay? And so he used words to be able to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. We'll talk about that in a moment, okay? But we're told then specifically that he did this in two ways, his methods, okay? The first thing that he did was that he explained, the anoigo, okay, that he explained 
And it means literally through an opening up of. Okay, so many times like the opening of the womb. Okay, this word is like a birthing process. You know, the child comes through the opening of the womb. Okay, but it's also what Jesus did. Okay, with the ears and the eyes of those who were blind and those who were were deaf. He opened up through the opening up of their eyes, through the opening up of their ears. Okay, we're also told us what Jesus did um, to where the disciples on the road to Emmaus that he through the opening up of their minds to the word, okay? And so there's this idea that you want to open up people's minds to something that they were formerly what? Blind to, deaf to, not um, inclined to, to, to believe or listen to, okay? And so there's a process in doing this, okay? And so the second thing in which he did, then he demonstrated, okay, the peritithemy, okay, literally means to to lay alongside of something else. This is exactly what, what Jesus was spe- specifically stated to do with parables. Okay? You can almost picture this as more of an illustration kind of thing. Okay? But it's comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Okay? That, so as we look through passages and we study passages, again on your sermon note sheet, there's a lot of other passages for you to go check out. Okay, that explain the same concept. That's why they're there. I don't go through all of them all the time. Okay, but all those are there for you to continue to study, to check me out, to find out whether the things I'm teaching you are actually true. Okay, we'll talk about the Brians in a moment. I'll make that challenge to you again. Okay, okay, okay. And so, so he demonstrated um, all these things. And one was exciting is about the the use of laying out of food. Okay, and so this word is used of. When, when you put food out before somebody. In a sense, and I talk about this a lot, that when I preach, my goal is to have a smorgasbord. It's kind of like you're going to Golden Corral today. And I don't know if you, when you go to Golden Corral, if you get, you, let me ask, how many of you eat something of everything at one of those smorgasbords or one of those buffets? Oh, Mike's putting his hand up. Mike, I, don't do that, Mike. That's bad for you. I mean, honestly, when you walk in, when you walk into those places, the, the nice thing about going to those places when you have a, 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 a wider range of people is that they're going to have something for everyone. I just seriously don't get the, the lima beans when I go there. The succotash is succotash to me. Anyway, so, you know, green beans. I mean, if it comes to the vegetable side, I'm probably not going that side, right? There's the big meat section in the middle. Amen, right? Okay. And so the women can go to the vegetable section. The guys can go to the meat section. And uh, we're all happy. I mean, everybody's excited. <laughs> the dessert section. Hmm. <laughs> meat at the dessert section. No, no. I praise God for the milk allergy. I, I avoid, I, I, I don't even go to them anymore. And so, so anyways, but yes, it has something for me. Well, that's the idea then of it's sometimes when you got to know when you're talking to people what they like to eat. Does that make sense? Not everybody likes to eat the same thing. Some people want uh, the steak, something they can chew on. Some people want what? Pablum. Now, you wouldn't honestly admit that, okay? You wouldn't be, you want to say, oh, I'm the baby. You know, I just want to eat the, that, that rice stuff, put a little juice in it, and, oh, man, that's really good. No, I mean, honestly, you don't want to do that, okay? But some of us spiritually eat that way still, and that's all we want. We don't want to have to think. We just want pablum. Hebrews chapter 5 into chapter 6 says, by this time you ought to be teachers. But I've got to continue to bring to you the basic stuff. So when you're teaching, when you're presenting things, there is a, there's an idea of bringing a, a well-rounded knowledge, as we talked about in Sunday school with Padea, okay? That the, the whole concept then of sometimes things are going to be deeper. And I know that when if I go into Greek or go into Hebrew, some of your eyes are going to go, Ring! You know, it's okay, because some of you are, are, that'll speak to you, and you'll listen to that, and you'll get it, and you're going to dig a little bit deeper, okay? So the, Paul, which is exciting to me, okay, Paul's doing that. He's talking to the people, and different, you know, different people are at different stages of their life, and he's giving them these things, and he's bringing these things alongside it in order to open up their minds, in order to open up their understandings toward that, Okay? That's why it's important to be well-rounded in your knowledge of things. I don't know what I'm going to meet when I go and I knock on the door. If somebody wants to, if they're sports-oriented, if I see there they got sports stuff, I'm probably going to start 
with making a relationship on their sports stuff. Hey, what about da da da? If it's science, if it's whatever, I don't have to go deep with them. I just have to show them that I care about them and, and I know what they understand. And then I'm going to transition to what? The most important stuff. Yeah, to what's the most important thing, okay? So anyways, so that's what he's doing, his method. But his message is consistent with what he's declared all the way through. And so before I put this up, you guys can know this, right? 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, right? We say it's the kernel of the gospel. So, so kiddo, give me, give me a child. Give me a child. Quote to me 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. Who's going to do it? Who's going to be bold enough? Kaylee Rain's, look at her. She, yeah, I know. She's already doing it, Mark, and you're already pointing at her. All right, Kaylee Rain. Wait, wait. Where's the mic at? we have a mic? Can we bring, do I have one here? It's, it's a nopian. It's a nopian. You're going to be on stage. Just play the part. <laughs> yeah, do it again. Do a British accent. Uh, for we deliver to you, first of all, that which we also receive, that oh, Christ Christ died, <laughs> he was buried, he rose again on the third day, Okay. according but, to the scriptures. So why did Christ die? Christ died for? For our sins. On the? Third day. Yeah, no, according to the scriptures. To the Christ scriptures. died for our sins, according to the scripture, and that he was buried, and that he rose, rose again, again on the third day, according to the scriptures. Good job, okay? Okay, so look, that's a simple two verses, okay? But it gives you the whole steps of the gospel. And that's exactly then what Paul begins to teach to the believers or the, the, um, the Jewish people in the, in the synagogue at Thessalonica, right? He talks about the suffering of Messiah, that Messiah had to suffer, okay? And so you have a lot of verses on your sermon note sheet from the Old Testament places where it declares, okay? I mean, we know that from God's word. Psalm 22, Isaiah 53, that, that God had declared in the Old Covenant that when Messiah would come, the anointed one would come, he would be the payment, the propitiation for our sins, right? So he would suffer. But then he would also then raise from the dead. That's exactly right, okay? And so um, right there as well, with David saying, you will not allow... Uh, my body, okay, to, to see decay. And so the whole concept of the resurrection is new, and so or is, is not new. It was, un, it was known to them. Daniel chapter 12 talks about it, okay? Job talks about the resurrection, okay? But specific about the resurrection of the Messiah, that's there as well. And then the big deal, then the big deal, he identifies Messiah. He talks about how Messiah was going to come, he was going to suffer, how Messiah, when he comes, he would be raised from the dead. And this Jesus is him, whom we preach. He's the Messiah. Do you get it? That's important, okay? Now, again, this is a little aside, and I want to spend time on here, but we know in our day and age, 2 Corinthians chapter 11 is very clear that Paul says, I'm jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for some may come and preach to you another Jesus. They may preach to you another, bring to you another spirit, or they may bring to you another gospel. And you may very well accept it. And then he says the ones that do this are false workers. They're workers of Satan. And so they're doing the exact same thing that Satan would do. They're seeking to deceive, bring untruth. And these are um, that um, ministers, they pretend to be ministers of righteousness well he's an angel of light satan is the angel of light and so his his workers also pretend to be ministers of righteousness y'all that's pastors now it can be people out in the street as well but i think about that today okay james 3 1 be not many masters teachers literally be not many teachers for such have the greater condemnation i'm going to give an account to god for everything i teach you i believe that 100 i believe that okay and so, sadly, there are many people who are, I'm not going to judge and tell you who they are, makes sense? There's probably more than I even realize, okay? That are proclaiming another Jesus, leading people into another spirit to have faith in another gospel. In Sunday school, we've talked about Jehovah Witnesses, we've talked about Mormonism, Okay? No, those are clear. Those are easy. Those are, those are like, that's like setting up the straw man, okay? 
It gets hard when we start coming into what we say are real churches. And there are churches that want you still to believe that you can't be a believer if you don't go to their church. I never want to be that way. This isn't about Bob, and it's not about Family Bible Church. We want to proclaim the kingdom of God, and we want to proclaim his Messiah, his Christ, Jesus, regardless of where people go. Yeah? So, his message is the same message that we should have as well. So, that's the presentation of the gospel, but then there is the persuasion of the gospel, because we see that as Paul then proclaims this message at Thessalonica three weeks, right, in, in the Sabbath, on, on the Sabbath in the, in the uh, synagogue, that many people began to what? Believe it. So if you got your Bibles, okay, turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. And I want to read chapter 1 of 1 Thessalonians. Because this is Paul's letter to the church that began as a result of these three weeks. Does that make sense? Okay? And so this is what he has to, and this is his first letter to them. He has two letters, two letters to the believers of Thessalonica. Okay? And so he says, Paul, Silas, Silvanus, Silas, and Timothy. So these are the three guys that first went through there. To the church of the Thessalonians and God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you all, y'all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of our God and Father, knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. So he says, look, we came in, we proclaimed the gospel, you guys accepted it, right? Okay, but now he gets into what was, what, how that, how that showed out. What were the things that were revealed? And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy the Holy Spirit so that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith toward God has gone out, so that we do not need to say anything. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. What's the first thing we, they, we see then after they accept that? They become followers of the apostles. So I don't want to hide from that. They become followers of the apostles. And, and, and that is not necessarily evil in and of itself. The reality is whoever God uses in your life, okay, becomes very dear to you. How many of you love your mom or dad? Do you love your mom and dad? Okay, put your hands down. Let me ask the most important question. Why? And the reality is, I don't care what answer you give me right now, but the reality is, the answer is, because they're your mom and dad. That's it. Because they're your mom and dad. There's no other reason. It could be because they did nice to me or whatever, but I, I can introduce you to people who've been beaten by their mom and dad. Like, not just like spanked, beaten. Okay, you kids get that. That's a good thing, okay? But like beaten bad but they still love their mom and dad. Why? Because it's their mom and dad. There's something about the person who God uses to give you birth and to bring you life. They become special to you, okay? But if that person's worth their weight in salt, what do they want to do? They want to point you to who? They want to point you to Jesus. And so you then be they became followers of, of the Lord, okay? Because I don't want people to become Bobites. You know, we're going to get to the end of the book of Acts some year from now. Anyways, in a couple months. And, uh, and he says to, to King Agrippa, King Agrippa says, you almost persuaded me. He says, I wish I could persuade you. I wish you could become just like me. 
except for these chains. But I wish that you'd be like me. So in the same sense, Paul says in, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. So there's the goal is that when you're leading people and God uses you to, to draw them into salvation, you become special. Okay? But you want to then continually point them to the Lord. And so they did. And look what happened. When they received the word, they received the word in much affliction. We're going to see it in just a moment with rejection, but you already weirdly read Acts 17, right? 1 to 15. <clears throat> what happens to Paul in just a moment in, in, in Thessalonica? The people are going to what? They're going to riot. They're going to turn from him. There's going to be a mob, all this kind of stuff. And these people who he's talking to saw all of it. Now, if you saw all of that happening, <clears throat> would you want what this guy got to give? But these people accepted the truth in the midst of great affliction, knowing that they'd probably be targeted. I mean, the house of Jason is going to be mobbed. Not a great selling point. But these people accepted it. <clears throat> they turned from idols. Appreciate your testimony, Tammy. That's exactly right. An idol is when we make God in our image. And so <clears throat> even those silver, gold, wood, what were they doing? They were making something like them. Remember that tonight when we watch the movie Joshua, okay? That comes out a little bit um, in the movie. You'll, you'll, you'll get it if you come tonight. You'll understand it. And so... Um, so whatever we put in the place of the one who deserves it, God, right, becomes an idol in our life, okay? And so Michael Card has a statement in one of his um, things, we've made you in our image, so our faith is idolatry. Yeah, you know it. And so it's, it's a, always, for 20 years, that thing has stuck with me, that line. It's just a powerful line. Am I making God in my, in my image? Do I make God as I want him to be? rather than how he has declared himself to be in the word. So they turned from idols to serve the living true God, but then they chose to wait for Jesus from where? From heaven. I want just a small little thing. I don't want to get into uh, premillennialism. I don't want to get into amillennialism. But amillennialists, the ones who don't believe there's a millennium, will tell you that Jesus came in the, the clouds of the hoofbeats of the Roman army when Rome destroyed Jerusalem back in 70 AD. That's just nuts to me. That, that real believers believe that. It's like, and I mean, that's like Presbyterians and stuff like that, you know, the people who are all millennial, that's, that's what they believe. But clearly, we're continually told in God's word that Jesus is going to come from where? From heaven. He's not going to come from the earth, okay? He's going to come from heaven, okay? So the Thessalonians bought into that, and they were waiting for it. So challenge? Am I waiting for it? Yeah? Does this describe me? Does this describe you? That even if it was in much affliction, you're good with the word, and you're good with facing the affliction? That you've put aside all those things that you're making in your image, and in, in, the, in the idol of your life, and that you are literally waiting for Jesus to come. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Well, then they had this rejection, right? Well, what was it caused by? Jealousy of the Jews. Well, what caused the jealousy of the Jews? When did it start? Think about it. This is going to be consistent everywhere they go. But why? Why? What happened? The crowd gathers. Go, go more detail. They want to follow the apostles. What kind of crowd? No, no, the mob's not yet. There's not a mob. Say it again, John. A crowd of Gentiles. Because of their jealousy, the gospel was open to the Gentiles. Prejudice. Again, the cause of this whole thing, right? And we've watched this with social media in the last couple years. Okay? How they froth up a crowd who doesn't even know why they're doing what they're doing. Right? And, and they get this mob mentality. But what begins the whole thing? Jealousy. Okay? These guys become jealous that they're opening to the Gentiles. And so what do they do? Things probably that they wouldn't have ever thought that they would do before. They now go out 
and take to themselves evil men, guys that they would have abhorred, theoretically, but now they take them in order for them to be the ones who stir up a mob, mob violence. And if you ever study out mob violence, the overwhelming majority of the people involved in any of those riotous activities have no clue why they're doing what they're doing. That's exact. They have no idea. They just are, oh, I mean, the day that they're, crucify him, crucify him. You know, it was a mob thing. They had no idea. They were just going, being paid to do what they're going to do. But the ones who were celebrating Jesus were back celebrating Passover. They weren't part of that mob. Anyways, they made a mob, setting the city in an uproar and assaulting Jason's house. Okay? And so, their accusation, when they finally go to bring him before the, the authorities, they're causing us to do things that are against Roman law. What was it? Literally, it doesn't say this here, but if you read it, they're declaring another king. This is similar to what, again, it's all been about. When the Jews brought the accusation against Jesus before Pilate, what did they ultimately accuse him of? Because they couldn't get anything else to stick. He was a king. Pilate says, are you a king then? Not Caesar, but Pilate. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you're right. <clears throat> That's right. Because they had Caesar worship. So king worship. And so, are you a king then? Jesus says, you said it. But my kingdom is what? Not of this world. If it was of this world, then my, 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 my people, my people would, would, would rise up. And so, so he is a king. And my allegiance to him, I want you to think about this. This is huge. Because I think a lot of American Christians struggle with this one. My allegiance to Jesus is greater than my allegiance to the United States. Now, if that causes you to burp a little bit, it needs to. Okay, we have the, the, the T-shirt that we're going to be doing for, if anybody wants it, today's the last day, you got to sign up for it, okay? But anyways, but it, this little freedom kind of shirt, you know, so it's good for Memorial Day, 4th of July, that kind of stuff, you know, that you can put on it. And again, you'll have the Family Bible Church, you'll be walking, to, uh, sign for us. And so, um, but I don't have a problem with that. Again, spent 11 years in the military, okay? So I love my country. But my allegiance, my ultimate allegiance, is to Jesus, not to this country, not even to the Constitution of the United States, which I actually swore to defend, right? I didn't swear to defend the president. I didn't swear to defend the, the Congress. I swore to defend the Constitution of the United States. And a lot of you are saying, yeah, because you've been in the military. You get it, okay? But my ultimate allegiance is to Jesus. So here's the deal. That's an accusation. That ought to stick. It's an accusation that ought to stick. It's not right in how they do it. But if you're asked, who is your highest sovereign? The answer ought to be Jesus Christ. The one and only true God, Yeshua HaMashiach, Yahweh incarnate. That's exactly right. So, from there, then, they're sent out, and they go to Berea. So, Berea is much faster, but what we note about Berea is in a reception that we see this nobility of the Bereans. They were more fair-minded. They were more noble. Depends on your translation of the word, but you can see there, Uganes, okay, literally means to be well-bred, born, born well-bred, okay? Good, goodly born, okay, is the idea, okay? And so, that sounds tacky. But we understand the concept, and that is that um, the goodly born are ones who are smart, intellectual, they're trying to learn, okay? That those who are slovenly born aren't looking into things, and they're just being led as the mob. Make sense? And so these Bereans, okay, were more Uganes, more noble, more fair-minded. Why? Why are they defined as being such? Because they searched the scriptures daily. They received it, first of all, with this forward passion. 
That's the word where it says, and how they, they, they embraced it, how they accepted it. Because they were already moving forward with a passion for God. Okay? So, prothemus. So, um, when we talk about um, our passions, um, epithemia is the, is the Greek word for a lust. So, you have a sarcotic epithemia, you have an ophthalmologic epithemia. Um, you say, oh, that sounds awful, and it is, it's deadly. Okay? But what that is is lust of the flesh and lust of the eyes. Lust of the flesh and lust of the eyes are deadly, right? The wages of sin is death. Okay? Good job, buddy. But the gift of God is eternal life. How? Through Jesus Christ our Lord, okay? So, so, so epithemia is the word for lust, okay? Epi means a focused. Thymia means passion or desire. So this word here, okay, is a prothemia, prothemia okay? And so, so it's a passion, it's a desire moving towards something is, is the idea, okay? And so that's how they, when, when, when the word was spoken to them, that's what they received it with. They received it with a passion. A readiness, a passion, though. They, they were excited about it. So let me ask, you're here today, so, you know, and I'm a long-winded preacher, and so you're here anyway, okay? And so, so that gives you some credit. Probably no points in heaven, but you're still there, okay? So, so I'm singing to the choir, okay? But when you hear the word taught, is it exciting to you? you got to ask. I mean, kids, did your, did your parents bring you? Did they force you to come? What's going to happen five years from now when you don't have to go? Because they're not there to make you go. Do you want it? Are you excited? about? Or do you have this forward passion because you want to know truth? Well, then they did what? They examined it on a crino. The word for crino is to judge. Literally, this is a courtroom um, term, okay, where um, they are actually examining, okay, so it's used. You have the, the verses on your sermon note sheet. Okay, to, to see how this is how this plays out. Okay, that they're like examining the word to find out what is true. Do you remember in Sunday school how we talked about that? Sadly, for years though, you'd have to put your hand on this book and you'd say, "What? I swear to tell the, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth." Okay, now we don't know what that really means anymore. Okay, but back then they did. And so they were examining it to find out truth. They wanted to know truth. And so they didn't believe, think about this, they didn't believe anything that Paul said. But they searched the scriptures, how often? How often? Say it one more time. Does that cause a little bit of toes to be stepped on? That the, the ordinary people, ordinary people of Berea, they were examining, searching. Now you need to understand, <clears throat> to, to whom much is given, much is what? How many of those people had, to, had a scroll in their house? None of them. So in order for them to search the scripture daily, they had to do what? They, they had to get to the synagogue. Okay? And they had to be pouring into it to find out whether the things were true. You got it in, in a book form. You got it on your cell phone. Again, I mean, I could look up on, on this right now. I have all offline, Hebrew, Greek, English, multiple versions. You know, I got the Spanish on here. I got Croatian on here. I mean, I could look it up in a lot of different languages if I wanted to, right? I have no excuse. You have no excuse. Not to search the scriptures. How often? Yeah. So how do you start your day? How do you spend your day? I can, I can tell you that if I don't start my day with quiet time, it doesn't happen. Life happens. Life happens. I just want to challenge. I know and this is a, a broken record sometimes, but I challenge you in it. This is huge. This is critical to search the scriptures daily. Well, they did it. They didn't believe anything Paul said. I don't believe anything I tell you. Please. Search the scriptures to find out whether what I'm telling you is what? True. If I say something that is not biblical, not just you don't like it, not just you don't agree with it,
but it's not biblical. Even while I'm speaking, someone ought to stop me. You oughtn't be just waiting to the end to maybe say something in question and answer time. It ought to be stopped. Whoa, Bob, foul. God didn't say that. That's not his word. That's your word. Make sense? Again, because if you're following the teachings of a man, you're still going to go to hell. The blind leading the blind. We have to be fair-minded, noble, forward, passion, excited about receiving the word, and then searching it daily to find out whether the things are true. Therefore, many of them believed. Because they had this attitude, what happened? They believed. The conversion of the Bereans happened because they searched the scriptures daily. Do you know how Bob was saved? How Bob was saved? I've told my testimony. How was Bob saved? Reading the scriptures. Someone challenged me to read it. And it was when I finally got, so Genesis 1 was a struggle we talked about this morning, right? But I still wasn't saved. That just challenged the basis of my faith or, or what my authority was. It's one in Romans 1, 2, 3, and 4 when I realized that even the Gentiles have a law unto themselves. And I had a law unto myself. And I wasn't even living according to my own laws. That I was condemned not by the law of God. I was condemned by the law of Bob. Now I want you to think about that one. I didn't even need the law of God to condemn Bob. The law of Bob condemned Bob. Bob couldn't even live into the standards that Bob set for himself. That's exactly right. And if I couldn't live to the standards of Bob, how could I ever live to the standards of God? And being condemned, I knew I needed a Savior. But it's God's Word that brings us unto redemption. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the Word of God. Okay. So finally, the rejection. <clears throat> Not a whole lot stated here um, other than what happens. Well, Jews from Thessalonica come to Perea. And what do they do? They cause up the, the, stir up the mob again against them. Okay? There will always be people who will stand opposed to the presentation of the gospel. Deal with it. As you said, not everybody's going to accept it. No one, no, not everybody's going to accept it. It's okay. We knock on doors. I mean, we ring doorbells now. People see who's at their door. They don't even come to the door. It's exciting when we get people to come to the door. But this week, where's Justin? I got, I got, he's here. We got, I got one of my first, right? Where a guy opened the door up and he said, what? Yeah, you guys sound something, get out of here. <laughs> I was, no, no, no. Actually, we're giving something for free. <laughs> so, <laughs> if you're selling something, get out of here. <laughs> Yes, if you're selling something, get out of here. Yeah. And so, but he was, I mean, it was my, the first one in a long time where I actually had somebody meet the door angrily. I've had a lot of people close the door on me, not want, hey, no, I'm not interested in close the door. But this guy came out like he was going to intimidate us. Like, Rawr! you know, like, wow, okay, this is kind of cool. And, um, and so I had the, the, the invitation to the, to the picnic right there. And I said, actually, I have, I'm giving you something for free. Oh, oh. <laughs> so, anyways, a lot of fun. But the point is, not everybody wants what you're selling, quote unquote, even though you're not what? You're not selling it, okay? All right, so the rejection. So, in the end, what is your response to the Word of God? Do you receive it passionately, study it and apply it, or do you reject it? How do you react when you're confronted with the truth that opposes what you have previously held? Ooh. Because that, isn't that what happens? They find out that the gospel is being opened up to who? The Gentiles? And it doesn't work well, doesn't it? I mean, that doesn't. So how do they react? How do you react? How do I react? When God reveals something, that wasn't necessarily what I believed before. Is your transformation such that others have noticed it and talked about it? Was it ever? If people haven't noticed that Christ has made a difference in your life, then you really need to ask whether Christ has ever entered your life. Is there then a need to change the way you think, 
and ultimately then change the way you act. Let's pray. Father, thank you for you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your word, which is true. And we know that your word is truth because you are truth. And so, Father, I am grateful um, that you have worked through 40 different people, men, over 1,600 years-ish to proclaim your truth. And Lord, that you have allowed it to still be with us even today, 2,000 years later. What an amazing thing. And for us to be reading of these accounts of Paul and Silas and Timothy and how you used them in the lives of people as they traveled thousands of miles in order for people to hear about Jesus. Lord, I pray that you would convict us of our need to tell people about Jesus, about our need to be able to live out the truth that we read as well. And Lord, that we would be passionate about you and your word, that we might know it, that we might be able to share it to others. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.